Good morning and welcome to another episode of Region ZMS Update. We're on site with the White Bear Lake Fire Department this morning. One, because there's some pretty cool people here, or so I was told. Two, because this is a completely different department than when we last filmed here two years ago. New chief, new staff, and even new equipment. And three, because my kids go to school nearby, so it's really convenient for me to get here on time after I drop them off. And as you know, my convenience is the primary consideration for these videos. And finally, we just really need to get out of the office from time to time. And what better way to kill a few hours than in the city of lakes and legends? Coming up, we're gonna talk about pediatric head injuries with our new critical care educator, Nurse Cassie, review some equipment and skills with one of our clinical supervisors, Kent Griffith, and head back to the studio to bring you all the latest breaking EMS news from our area. So get ready, I'm Dr. Peterson, this is Regions EMS Update, and here are the three things you need to know. Hi, I'm Cassie, and I'm a pediatric ER nurse as well as the critical care education specialist for Regions EMS. I want to take a minute to talk about pediatric sports-related head injuries. The number of mild traumatic brain injuries has increased steadily over the past 10 years. It's tough to get an exact number that occur yearly, but it's estimated that 70% of all sports recreation-related TBI ER visits were among persons aged 10 to 19 years with the majority of those being males. Football, soccer, and basketball injuries are most commonly reported, and of course, in this state, hockey. With the shot, he scores! It was tipped out in front, I believe, and it may have been by Gary and Romanco. Ouch. Well, let's take a minute to talk about what to do when you're called to the scene of a sports injury involving a pediatric patient with a suspected head injury. Not every concussion looks identical, but the following signs and symptoms are common findings in mild traumatic brain injuries. They include headache, nausea, vomiting, confusion or amnesia, anxiety or irritability, blurred vision, and a GCS between 13 and 15. While it can be difficult deciphering the severity of an injury based on clinical symptoms versus the reaction of the parents and bystanders, there are clues in the history that can give us some insight. Ask what the mechanism of injury is. What caused the injury? How did it happen? Ask the patient if they remembered what happened. What was the immediate clinical presentation of the patient? Did they lose consciousness? If so, for how long? Did they get up and go to the bench? Were they confused? Take note that adults and guardians who are familiar with this child may be able to give you better insight if their patient is at their baseline. What risk factors are present? This includes a previous TBI, if it was practice or a game, athletes are more likely to have high impact collisions during a game compared to practice, and if the patient was wearing the correct protective gear, such as a helmet when riding a bike. If there's ever any question on whether or not a patient has suffered a mild traumatic brain injury, remember this. When in doubt, sit them out. A previous mild traumatic brain injury is the number one risk factor for sustaining a second. There is a 50% mortality rate in patients who suffer from second impact syndrome, a condition where a person suffers a second TBI prior to the resolution of symptoms from their first TBI, resulting in the loss of autoregulation in the brain as well as cerebral edema. Any athlete that is being evaluated on the sideline must prove that they do not have a concussion before returning to play by proving absence of symptoms and a normal exam. Remember, when in doubt, sit them out. Educate players, coaches, and parents about this. The Minnesota State High School League requires clearance from a licensed healthcare professional to return to play after sustaining a concussion. Furthermore, the league has instituted a rule for all student athletes. 
any athlete who exhibits signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with a concussion, such as loss of consciousness, headache, dizziness, confusion, or balance problems, shall be immediately removed from the contest and shall not return to play until cleared by an appropriate healthcare professional. When in doubt, sit them out. When do you transport? It's safe to say that if there are life-threatening injuries, you transport. However, since symptoms can be delayed and each TBI injury is different, it's important to know when to go. If a patient has prolonged loss of consciousness for greater than one minute, if there's concern for a cervical spinal injury, remember kids have big heads and lack neck muscles at younger ages, which increases their risk for a cervical spinal injury. Was the mechanism of injury high risk or high impact? Was it a player that ran full speed into a goalpost? A pitcher that was hit in the head with a baseball? A cheerleader that fell from the top of the pyramid? Those injuries sustained from high speed or velocity should be evaluated in the ER. Are there any signs of a skull fracture, including a palpable deformity of the skull or leaking of CSF from the nose or ears? Is the patient experiencing any seizure activity? Seizures caused by trauma may actually indicate hemorrhage, buying your patient a ticket to the ER. Lastly, monitor your patient for any worsening in their condition, including persistent vomiting, increased sleepiness or responsiveness, difficulty walking or talking, or any focal neurological deficits. These may all be signs of an intracranial hemorrhage as well and should be evaluated in the ER. So, the next time you're called to the scene of a sports-related head injury, remember these few things. Assess for signs and symptoms of a head injury, and remember, not all traumatic brain injuries look exactly the same. Get a detailed history to give you clues to potential injuries that have been sustained. When in doubt, sit them out. If a player isn't transported but you suspect a mild traumatic brain injury, educate the player, coach, parents that they still need to be evaluated and cleared by an appropriate healthcare professional. And know when to go. Based on your evaluation in the history, know when this could potentially be more than just a mild TBI and transport is needed. Thanks for tuning in. If you have any further questions, please reach out at emseducation at healthpartners.com. Hi, Kent Griffith from Region EMS. I'm here today to talk about two products that our medical direction group has recommended for your use. The first and probably most simple is the suction catheter. Typically, you're used to using the Yankauer. It's been around for a long time. It's a thumb controlled suction device and it does a pretty good job of getting rid of some secretions, but it's a smaller bore suction catheter. So recently we've come upon a device called the Ducanto suction. It's a much larger diameter suction. It has no thumb control and allows you to, to suction out continuously large amounts of blood or emesis or products of, of the emesis. So it can be uh, rapidly put into the oral, upper oral airway uh, and uh, decontaminate that uh, when there is products such as vomit or blood. The other product uh, which you're much more used to is having bag valve masks. Currently the Ambo Spur is the most common one used in our system and you have to have two of them at least, an adult bag and a pediatric bag. Uh, we have come across a new device that incorporates a lot of these features plus some other real neat features I want to go through. So this is the Mercury Medical Small Adult BVM. And with this device, you only need to carry one size for both adults and pediatrics. So it takes away having to have two devices uh, in your ambulance, in your bags. All right, so I'm going to show you a little of the features, a few of the features of this BVM. Uh, you're probably used to the Ambu bag, which is a, for adults, is much larger than that. Yeah. It has a greater volume. This has a volume of about a thousand cc's, uh, and you're not going to need that much. Recommendations from the AHA now are about four to five hundred cc's per breath. And how do you know how much you're getting? Well, this one has a smart manometer on it, and when I ventilate, I just ventilate into the green. 
Uh, if I'm into the yellow or to the red, I'm hyperventilating that patient and I don't need to do that. Uh, also integrated into this, by pulling this little tab here, I'll get a timing light and that will uh, tell me to appropriately ventilate once every six to eight seconds. Uh, also in this bag is a built-in uh, peep valve. So normally a patient who is being ventilated should have five centimeters of peep as a physiologic uh, part of their ventilation. So it keeps the, all the alveoli, or opens up all the alveoli that uh, tend to close off when people are hypoventilating. So by doing this, I'm gonna ventilate the patient once every six seconds, and you'll notice as the lungs uh, decompress, it takes a little bit longer with the peep valve off, so on. So watch as I do that, you'll notice it takes a little bit longer, take the peep valve off, and those lungs collapse much more quickly. So it tends, like CPAP, to keep those lungs open just a little bit longer so that more oxygen can get into the cellular level, to the alveoli level. Um, and then because it's also a pediatric bag, uh, again, I don't need to go any, change anything in my ventilations. I just need to keep that in the green. But some patients in the pediatric population, maybe the near drowning patient, needs um, more pressure in order to get their lungs to expand. So pediatric bags usually have a feature that you can lock out that pop off. And so by pushing this little clip, now I can maintain the pressure I need to get those lungs to expand uh, in, in those pediatric cases. So it has a lot of neat features in there. Uh, it's disposable, it's smaller, and now you only need one bag to carry in your, in your bag of equipment for oxygenation of both the adult and the pediatric patient. It's fantastic. It is fantastic. <laughs>
Uh, a copy of this script along with the phone number will be posted uh, somewhere in your ambulance. I would suggest that at least the phone number uh, be attached to the Lucas so that everybody has that in hand just in case you didn't put it in your uh, phone. There is a protocol uh, which uh, you all need to be familiar with. The protocol has much more expensive detail uh, onto the pro into the process. Um, and I expect that you would uh, you'd know that protocol just like you would all your other protocols. We will be uh, distributing that protocol uh, by email. <clears throat> Remember that the family or caregiver has the final say as to the patient's destination. Within reason, obviously, it has to be a destination that your service transfers to. Under no circumstances should the ECMO team be canceled once the team is activated. This is because it's the natural course of RF to have recurrent ROSs. Canceling the team may preclude the patient from receiving a life-saving procedure. Finally, this is the first time this is being done extensively in the United States, really throughout the world. There will be changes as we progress. Any change will be made to optimize the care of your patients. But in the end, it's just like the good old days, except the phone number has changed. Thank you for your, your participation in this extremely important project. And Dr. Peterson, eat your heart out. Thanks to Chief Greg Peterson and the men and women of the White Bear Lake Fire Department for hosting us today and taking the time to show off their shiny new engine. If any of this content was helpful for you, please like, subscribe, or leave a comment on one of our social media pages, or drop us a line at emseducation at healthpartners.com. That will wrap up this edition of Regions EMS Update. Until next time, I'm Dr. Peterson. Stay smart, stay safe, and stay professional. <laughs>